Hi, you guys. Welcome back to the I Believe podcast. I'm Danae Peterson, and I'm here with Dr. Sapna Patel. She's from MD Anderson. I'm going to toss it over to her so she can introduce herself briefly. Thanks, Danae. Yeah, I'm Sapna Patel, medical oncologist at MD Anderson. I direct the uveal melanoma program here. Um, and I've been seeing patients for more than a decade. I'm probably in my 12th year or so seeing patients. More than half my practice is uveal melanoma. I do also see skin melanoma and some other rare subtypes of melanoma. All right. Well, awesome. It's, I mean, it's fantastic to have, um, just as you know, like it's rare for someone in the oncology field to be aware of uveal melanoma to begin with. So the fact that more than half of your patients are uveal melanoma patients is I mean, that, that makes you as much of an expert as you can be in this field. I think, um, no pressure, <laughs> no pressure, but I know you're, you're always learning and you guys are, you guys are so involved in the research and the understanding of how this disease works. Um, so let's just kind of jump right into it. Um, we want to talk a little bit about how patients can be, uh, involved in the shared decision-making of, you know, how they make decisions with their medical diagnosis, with, kind of the, with the unknowns, with, um, new, new pieces to their diagnosis. So let's just kind of drop it where it is. Like say a patient is newly metastatic. Um, you are their doctor or they come to you as their doctor and, um, they've been informed of this. Like how, how does this kind of decision-making process start for you as a doctor? And how do you go about, I guess, catering that to each patient? Yeah, that's a, I mean, this term shared decision-making, I think is really important. It really is the new way of practicing medicine. Um, several generations ago, there was a very paternalistic sense in medicine. This is what I'm prescribing for you. This is the treatment and this is what you're doing. And that really doesn't fly with kind of our modern patients. Um, it wouldn't fly with the way we're thinking about how we make decisions in our household, in our companies, and it really doesn't fly anymore in the doctor's office. So shared decision making really starts by figuring out what kind of provider your patient needs you to be. We call that situational leadership. You know, do you need to be a coach for them where you cheer them al along the way? Do you need to be a teacher or professor where you share information and um, kind of increase their knowledge? Do you need to be uh, negotiators where they bring you options and you say what options you have and then you talk through the pros and cons? And some of that you uncover at the very first visit. Um, there are tools maybe in, you know, if, if providers are interested, but there are some tools that can kind of help you um, establish what kind of, what kind of leader or physician does your patient need you to be? If it's interesting, yeah. I could maybe go into some of those. Tools. Yeah, I think um, maybe let's just run through like what are, what are maybe your, your top few tools that you, you use as a, as a provider um, to figure that out and to kind of figure out what kind of a doctor does your patient need you to be? Because I feel like that would be kind of tricky as a, as a practitioner to feel like, okay, how do I feel this patient out and what yeah. tools can I use to figure that out? I mean, I mean, it's hard enough being a parent and figuring out, okay, what kind of a parent do I need to be with That's my right. kid? Like I can That's imagine right. having countless numbers of patients that you see over the course of a day and a week to kind of have to tweak that. Like it would be good to, to understand kind of what goes, what goes into that. Yeah. And, you know, people don't come to these visits alone, right? They bring their caregivers, they bring their friends, family, spouses. And so it is catering to kind of a, a, a whole family set of needs, a whole community set of needs. And you don't have to feel like you're just kind of blind at that first visit. And I guess no pun intended, that you're just walking into this not really knowing, you know, what do people need? I guess I just have to start asking a series of questions. Many years ago, um, uh, a uh, physician, a researcher at MD Anderson, his name was Walter Bale. He came up with something called the SPIKES protocol. And this got taught to us when we were oncology fellows. And I have found it to be incredibly useful. And even to this day, when I see a patient and I have to either break bad news or I'm meeting them for the first time, I find that this outline really helps. So S stands for setting the stage. Um, you know, I think most people can agree Fear of the unknown is unsettling and it's distracting. And so if you're going to have a procedure or if you're sit sitting in a doctor's office, a doctor you've never met for the first time, you don't even know what to expect. Do they, are they going to make me get naked? Are they going to put their hands on me and do an exam? Are we going to talk? Are they going to ask me for all my records? You really don't know. And so the first part of setting the stage is really just telling them, it's nice to meet you. Here's what we're going to do today. This is a 40-minute visit. 
we're going to go carefully through your history. Then we're going to put you in a gown. I'm going to do an exam. If there's any tests or labs that are needed, we'll send you for that afterwards. And then we'll make a plan to bring you back to go over everything. Now that you've got that out of the way, now the patient and family knows what to expect, especially if you say, we're going to go over your history and you can interrupt at any time to ask questions. Now they know, you know, I can do that. If you're the kind of person. Well, and and like you said, like the fear of the unknown is, is such a huge part of this that even if it's just for this 40 minutes, if you can create some semblance of certainty for 40 minutes. Yes then that gives them a sense of safety and a sense of like, okay. And if you can get the brain to calm down, then we can make decisions and we're no longer in fight or flight mode. Um, just, I mean, just psychologically, it makes a ton of sense that this is, this is kind of the science behind it as far as why it works and why the brain needs this. Yeah. So we're setting the stage for them and then we're asking them, what do you know about your diagnosis? That's the P perception. What do you know? What do you know about what stage you are? Do you know if you're a class one or class two? And of course, with uveal melanoma, it gets tricky, right? Because we talk about class one, class two. And sometimes people say, I think I'm a stage two. And then we have to kind of unpack, do you mean stage? Do you mean class? You know, what do, what do they know? And that will tell a provider you know, where their starting point is. If a patient says, I don't know anything, my referring doctor didn't tell me anything. They, they didn't tell me anything about my diagnosis, this, that, or the other, then you know you have to fill in that knowledge gap. If they come and they say, I know that I'm metastatic, BAP1 positive, um, this, that, and the other, you know, then you have that starting point. So perception tells you where you're starting from. Mm-hmm. And then I is um, the invitation. You in a, in a way, you try to ask them, okay, what was the purpose of this visit for you? Well, you made this appointment so that... And you invite them to kind of fill in what their needs are. Not everybody that comes to MD Anderson to see me is coming to become my long-term patient. Many times people are coming because they want a second opinion. They're very comfortable with the treatment plan that they've had recommended, and they would just like a second opinion. In other cases, sometimes patients are coming because they've received treatment at home, and now they might be out of options, and they want to see if we have anything else. And yes, they would consider being a long-term you know, patient coming back and forth from Houston. So you you set the stage, you've established that this is a safe space, this is what the next 40 minutes are going to look like in this appointment, or in our follow-up, sad to say, more like 15 minutes, but um, you've set the kind of stage and the expectations for the visit, you've asked them what they know, what their perception is about their cancer, and then you've invited them to tell you what they need from the visit, what would they mm-hmm. like, to, you know, why did they make this appointment? And then K is knowledge. From that point, you know where they're starting from and you fill them with knowledge. If they really need everything from, okay, this is eye cancer that has spread to your liver. It's not a separate liver cancer. It's from the eye. And we know that because of this, that, or the other. Here are the treatment options, so forth and so on. If they've received treatment and now they want to know what can they do after receiving that first round of treatment, then you you fill in the knowledge there. And then E is emotions and empathy. You basically... Um, acknowledge the emotion. So how are they feeling after you've shared all this information? It's very normal for somebody to say, I I don't know, I'm overwhelmed. You know, you've given them too much information and then you know, okay, now you can stop delivering knowledge. You can just stop and peel back and say, okay, overwhelmed is normal. You can validate those feelings and decide what they need next. Would it be helpful for you to think about what was said, review any notes or recordings that you might have taken And should we make an appointment again in one or two weeks to think through, you know, strategies? If a patient says, I'm, I've had this happen where people say, well, I came in pretty sad and hopeless, but you've told me that there are options and you've got treatments and I've never heard of these and I'm excited and now it makes me think there's something to do. Then you know that there's a little bit of enthusiasm and hope there and you can make a plan for that. So, you know, what should we do next to make, make a plan for your, for your cancer? So I think the spikes outline is the the last one, the the S in spikes can be, you Mm -hmm. know, make your strategy. What's your strategy for follow-up next steps, whatever, talking to the referring physician, if they'd like to go back. I think the spikes tool really helps a a physician or a provider find out what does the patient need from you. And it also offers, like you said, really safe kind of boundaries for what are we, what are we going to do here? And what is this visit about? 
Yeah. So, I mean, I think just in light of that, like you said, that that the the spikes protocol can help kind of provide that sense of safety. And and if you are seeing a patient who is just newly finding out, like, okay, my cancer has spread from my eye to my liver or to something, you know, and I don't, you know, maybe I understand it or I don't on some degree and I'm still working on kind of grasping this. Um, but the fact remains that I'm here. I need the support. I need to understand. And like, you know, you as a doctor, like we, we need, we need you as patients, like we need you to, to be present with what, with what is going on and with what kinds of, um, I guess, steps need to be taken. So, um, I guess the, the other kind of question is, you know, this kind of, this kind of process, you know, this 40 minute visit, obviously by the end of this 40 minute visit, somebody's not going and having treatment that day. Um, so how do you then, I mean, if, if you have a patient who maybe, I mean, that urgency is there, but they're enthusiastic, they want to get started with treatment. Um, how do you kind of help? I, I don't know the best way to say this, but just like kind of explain to the patient, the process of what this looks like and, um, and just helping them understand that this is a process, um, and this involves a, a team of people and that it's, it's going to take time. And, and I mean, I think it's part of validating, but just to, to recognize that like, <laughs> it may not ever feel fast enough, but we are yeah. doing the very best that we can. Um, I guess, how do you, how do you reassure the person who feels that sense of urgency and is very stressed by, by yeah, that urgency I mean, feeling? such a common sensation, right? And sometimes even we as providers feel it like, oh gosh, that surgeon isn't available for X number of um, weeks or the biopsy team can't do a biopsy for two more weeks. My goodness. So we, I think we all feel this sense of urgency. I think we have to remember, we know biologically that cancer didn't form yesterday. That cancer also took its time. We think the primary tumor in the eye develops anywhere two to five years before a person is actually diagnosed. So if, it, if at the time of primary diagnosis, let's say of your eye, your referring ophthalmologist sends you to a retinal specialist, and that retinal specialist takes a week to see you or two weeks and then another month to schedule the procedure, it turns out it's okay. The cancer is not getting wildly out of control in that time. Your mind might go out of control thinking that, but the cancer yes. will not. Yes, <laughs> that, that is the truth. That's tr what <laughs> happens, right? And then same when if, if your um, oncologist ever tells you, hey, there's a spot in the liver and we're watching it. Mm, it's not big enough yet. Uh, let's bring you back in a month or three months and see if it's growing. That You're going to have anxiety during that time thinking, well, now I know there's something, but it's not big enough to do anything. Is it growing? Is it not growing? And the truth is that cancer, you know, rarely doubles in the, in the course of a month or three months. It gets big enough to biopsy. It might enlarge by a few millimeters, but it's not wildly spreading across the body in that time frame. If that were the case, you know, we would never have a, a really a strong chance of treating any of our cancers, breast cancer, colon, anything. All of these cancers will take anywhere from six weeks to maybe eight or 12 weeks to get a firm treatment started. And that's okay. The sooner the better, of course, but we also want to ca caution any rushed decision making. So anybody mm -hmm. that you see that says, okay, well, we're going to start drug A tomorrow. There's a few things that you might want to consider. Well, should I get a second opinion? And is tomorrow enough time for me to, you know, seek advice either from my support network, from my groups, from my church, from another provider? Well, and, right? and the other thing too is that, I mean, I have this experience with my eye. Sometimes because you go through this period where you're given information and you're you're informed and you're you're given more knowledge about this unknown and you start to feel in the appointment as a patient you just start to feel like the 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 confidence from the provider like emanates and you feel yeah. it and you kind of absorb that as a patient which is a yeah. it's a good thing. good thing that's a very empowering thing as a patient and we need that we do need that because because then we go from helpless to okay I can, I can do this. I can, I can get through this. I can figure this out. My doctor has a plan. Like all of these pieces fall into place. But like you said, the problem then I think becomes when it, when it becomes something where you are almost, I don't want to say railroaded, but I think some patients can be, um, unintentionally railroaded into a fast decision. And, and so I think just making sure that, that they do take the time and the space to pull back and to say, okay, I felt really good at the end of that appointment. I felt like this doctor knew what they were talking about. Am I going to feel like this in two days? And, right. and if not, then do I, like you said, do I want a second opinion? How do I go about getting that second opinion? Um, 
And then I, I'm kind of just going back to, can I trust that it's okay for me to take the time to get the second opinion and just kind of calm my brain down and just recognize that, I mean, as, as unimaginable and as absolutely like terrifying seeing anything change in your diagnosis is that, like you said, it, it's not going to take you tomorrow. It's and, yeah. and so, you know, if it does end up being the thing that creates end of life in your life as a patient, it will be months, years, years and years out. And it's, it's not like a car accident where one day you're fine and the next day you're gone. That's right. Um, which is the thing kind of nice in some ways. <laughs> in some ways, yeah. It won't be the thing that it will take your life because of a delay in getting treatment started. You know, yeah. that's not what, what's um, causing liver failure in people. Mm -hmm. But the other thing about a rush decision is that there's some financial considerations, right? Because a rush decision means you want to make sure your insurance is going to cover this, that you're not going to get stuck with – um, a copay or coverage for something that insurance said, no, we don't want to do this. So you want to ask the right questions and make sure that things are getting authorized. Will my insurance pay for this? What will my out of pocket be? Do you have financial counseling for this treatment? Um, and similarly, as people are often thinking as, you know, you might think, we know there's not just one treatment and one size fits all that takes care of it. What about plan B and plan C? And if I do plan A, does it eliminate options like plan B and C down the road? Yeah. And well, so those are important that. questions, like yeah. very important questions to, and, and those are the kinds of questions, like you said, you can't really rush those. You, mm -hmm. it takes time to understand that it, it's, it's kind of like peeling back layers and pieces mm -hmm. um, to fully grasp. Okay. If I go down this path um, and I think that's, that's generally the question that I'm hearing is that as a patient, you know, if you decide on a path with your doctor, then the next question to kind of really just make sure that this is the right decision for you is to kind of follow the path and to kind of say, okay, if I do this path, I mean, I, we could draw a little diagram of like, okay, I do this and I go here. If it goes one way, we go here. If it goes the other way, yeah. we go here. And, yeah. and that, that kind of, that kind of a process of, of just seeing that it, it follows a flow and. Yeah. And I think that can be reassuring, but it also, like you said, it's going to unpack some of the, the complications along the way right. um, that could arise. It won't be just a straight line. It won't just be like, boom, yeah, here and be like, this tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> it'll be, it'll know, be if, wavy. If anybody early. is watching the YouTube video, our hands are going everywhere. <laughs> That's right. And actually uh -huh. years ago when we redid our clinic office, um, clinic rooms here at MD Anderson in Melanoma, I really insisted that we had whiteboards put in. For that very reason, I do like to draw these things. Okay. This is, if your test result comes back like this, we'll do this. If it comes back like this, we'll, we'll consider this. And then we have the patients just take a photograph of that at the end of the day. Yeah. Yeah, you know, no, that's a really phone. good tool, like a really mm -hmm. good way to help, like, because visuals are so key in helping, yeah. helping our brains grasp everything because it, it can feel, I mean, that level of overwhelm is so big and there's so much information at the beginning of the eye diagnosis, at the beginning of a METS diagnosis, there's so much information that we're taking in as patients that it's just like, you think you're getting it and you're just not because I mean, for, for so many reasons, the trauma of the initial, like finding it out and, and the kind of like. I don't know, we could argue it's almost like re-traumatizing. First you see it in a scan, then your doctor tells you, then you get a biopsy, like, and it's just like over and over, like, bam, bam, like, yes, yes, yes. And if you're lucky, there's a no, like somewhere in there where it's like, mm, never mind, we were wrong. But then you went through all of this trauma, like leading up to it going, yeah. <gasps> um, anxiety. No, that, you know, I mean. The, one of the other th cool things about shared decision-making that can sometimes work against us is in the United States, at least, there's been this kind of federal mandate to make your medical records transparent. So patients should be able to see their results in near real time. And that has sometimes caused issues because if you see your scan result or your biopsy result, yes. yeah, right? Before the doctor, it's, you have the doctor. It's a little bit, it's a little bit freaky. Um, yeah. I mean, yeah. and there's, I mean, I don't, I don't know that I would change it, you know, for myself, or I don't know that anyone else would change it for themselves, but it can be, it can be really, really nerve wracking because, because like you said, if you're finding out in real time, sometimes the doctor has time constraints. They have, they have yeah. a team that can only go as fast as they can go. And, yeah. and if they don't get to before you see the email, like then, then they yeah. just, they, they have to kind of do some, some backtracking of like, okay, like. And, and so in that What's case, you know, about? setting the stage might, setting the stage might look like, okay, well, have you seen your results? <laughs> if you right. have, okay, well, let me just like, let's work through this. And if you haven't, well, here's the results. Um, and that's, and, kind of and that's a tricky thing. 
Yeah, we also tell patients, you know, you will get a, um, so at, at MD Anderson, you get a pop up as a patient if you're about to see your results. Um, it will say you may be viewing results before your doctor has had a chance to review them and before your appointment. And we try to make a safety net appointment after any mm-hmm. tests are ordered so that if you have questions, you know you have an appointment coming up where you can ask that. Oh, I like that. Like, that's a really important piece. And I think right. that that sounds like a type of software that would be fabulous across the board because that is it is hard to to get a notification and to suspect that it could be, you know, news of some kind and to want the good news. And so you want to open it because you want the good news, but then you open it. And if it's not the good news, then you're finding out alone. And and that can be really hard. We want people to make sure they have a follow-up appointment. I mean, my father's experience, and and he's not a patient here at MD Anderson, but his experience is that he sees his results. He doesn't know how to interpret them and there's no follow-up appointment. So he doesn't know if he's bothering the the team, if he says, hey, is somebody going to call me to go over this? Um, should I make an appointment? He really doesn't know where to go with this. And so we yeah. like to order the tests and then make sure there's a follow-up a few days later. And then part of that strategy is saying, okay, you might review the results before we, but don't worry, write down any questions you have, any concerns that you have. And when you see that appointment a few days later, we'll go over them there. So you're not left to feeling like you have to Google this and what does it mean and what do I do? with that. Yeah. And we all know Google can be dangerous. (laughs) That can be super dangerous. And, and, you know, I think, um, so we want patients to be transparent. We want them to see their results. There are some safety things in there. So I, at least at our hospital, radiology will not release a preliminary report to a patient. It has to be finalized and signed. And then even then it's two working days after it's signed before it releases to the patient. Because at the time that the radiologist signs it, it gets um, into the ordering physician's basket Mm -hmm. and they can see the results and review it. And just because of sheer volume and humans, you know, we are just humans. That second set of eyes, that ordering physician now goes and sees, oh, I see something abnormal or I think it's normal, but we were following something. When we go and open, we can then question the result in those two days before the patient sees it. And so sometimes we do have patients get off the table from a CT scan and then within an hour send an email saying, can you send me my report? Can you send me my report? Which is which is ironic because, you know, here what happens is the scan obviously doesn't get read that fast, yeah, but it gets it's very read. rare. It's rare, right? It it's gets like read. TV time. Like, no, That's it right. doesn't happen that fast. <laughs> Gray's anatomy is not reality. That's right. <laughs> so it gets read in order of your follow-up appointment. So that's the other reason why it's really good to have a follow-up appointment because here the radiologist is saying, oh, the follow-up appointment is three months away. I can make this bottom of the pile. Oh, the follow-up appointment is tomorrow morning. This this is top priority. That's right. No, that makes sense. And that's helpful to understand that process. Um, And maybe it's not exactly the same for every radiology team, but, but that generally, I mean, that, that would make sense that, you know, if you have someone who's saying, I need this by the doctor is saying, I need it by this point, hence it's a stat order or, you know, regular order, then the process of looking at that would look different. Right. Um, so we've, I mean, we've kind of alluded to this in multiple different ways. Obviously you have, you have radiologists that you work with, you have nurse practitioners that you're working with. Um, what would you just say as far as, as far as patients are concerned, um, what would you just say to patients to just kind of help understand like you as a physician are a single human being? Yeah. Um, and so like, I guess I, how, how do you help patients or how would you help patients understand that a shared decision-making Includes the patient, yes, but it also includes everyone else involved. Um, oh, what a great point, Danae. Yeah, um, that shared decision-making is not the doctor making a decision. It really is the doctor's team. You know, I can't be so bold as to think, well, I saw the patient. I know my nurse saw the patient. I know my physician assistant saw the patient, but I'm going to come into the workroom and here's what we're doing. You know, we will have a dialogue. We'll you know, this, that, and the other. And then my physician assistant might say, oh, but did you know they have rheumatoid arthritis? Oh, you're right. Maybe that's not the ideal plan. That's going to cause more side effects. Let's do the. So it's a dialogue. It's a shared decision. And that's important for a few reasons. One, there is medical evidence that says the more people that look at your case and how, and, and ask questions about it, the better the outcomes. And that means pharmacists, medical students, you know, very senior physicians, nurses, everybody along the way who's looking at your case that could raise a question, could it impact your um, ability to do better on treatment or improve your survival? Medical evidence for that, number one. Number two is that that single human being, that physician, cannot be omnipotent or 
you know, all being all the time. That person has to take their own vacations, has to, you know, many times we get called for administrative responsibilities, or I have to go round in the hospital. And on those mornings that I'm rounding in the hospital, if a patient was waiting to only hear from me, so let's say they got good news on a scan, everything looks good, treatment is working, or the cancer has stayed away, but they think, I don't know. I, I don't know if I believe this. I need to hear it from the doctor. You know, that is difficult because then you're placing all of your trust in one person, but we are just, you know, one member of a very large team around here. We might be the, the most public facing that you see, but we're definitely part of a team. And the more you realize that, you know, a great team is what's keeping you going, it, not just a single person, the more you can, um, when that person has to go out or needs flexibility with scheduling or things like that, the more you will have faith that the covering doctors, the covering nurses, the other teams are, you know, basically either thinking along the same lines as your primary team, or they're communicating like that. You know, they're well, yeah, and that's that's such an important thing is to communicate. But I guess as you know, as a patient, what I'm taking away from this is it's important to get to know not just my providing doctor, but to know my team yeah. and to know who else who else can I touch face with, who else can I contact if I have a question, and to just kind of know that there are multiple points of contact, multiple points of like you said, a perception of how people are going to perceive and who's gonna question different things and and um and really, I mean, I, I think it, it's kind of like the human brain. The human brain doesn't just have one part of it that works and does all the work. It functions as a piece, you know, a piece of a whole. Um, yeah. And our bodies are the same way. You know, we have all of our organs and they all function together, but they all have to, they all have to be there. They're all part that's of right. the team. That's a great um, way of thinking about it. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I think that's, that's just helpful. Like to, I hope that patients can take away from that, that, that yes, you want to trust your doctor, but you also want to know your team. And so yeah. if you don't know your team currently, then, you know, make that a priority so that you can start learning the names of the nurses and get to know the people that you feel comfortable with. Um, because I think that being able to make those decisions and to not solely be guided by the doctor, but be able to work with a nurse practitioner or with the different nurses um, and to just be more, um, more heavily involved in, in the process really. And in, in yeah. giving input is such a, an empowering thing for patients. Danae, you know, who's going to answer the phone and who's going to respond to your chart message? It's most likely going to be those other team members. You're not always going to get a doctor who has free time to return your call or, or answer mm -hmm. your message, but it, it'll be those other team members. So the more you know who they are, you know that it's safe to ask them questions, um, so on and so forth. You won't have to always then make an appointment to come see the doctor because yeah, you know exactly. there are these other avenues. Well, Dr. Patel, I really appreciate you taking the time to just talk with us um, and to share your knowledge and to share your input. Uh, I really think that this this will be an, a helpful episode for patients. Um, so I just, before we close out, do you have anything else that you want to say just to end? Um, and I will just kind of let you, let you take it from there. Yeah, no, I mean, um, I think this was a great conversation because it really does get to what is it like to be a patient and what kind of what kind of tools might the doctor's office be using, but what also can you use or what can you know to feel empowered about um, your visit? It's normal not to absorb everything in a visit, even a follow-up visit. You may not really hear everything. So it's her, it's a great idea to bring a second set of ears, whether that's the recording device on your phone or a, a caregiver, family member, whoever, friend, that second set of ears. And then you can debrief in the car. Did you hear this? Did you hear them say this? I heard them say this. Um, always nice to ask them to write things down. That's why I like the whiteboard that people can take a picture of or um, ask them to write it in your notebook that you bring. Can you write that down in my notebook? Can you draw that diagram for me here? And that way you have the visual that might be more prompting than just, you know, the dry words. Um, and then just kind of sit with the information. It's always okay to ask follow-up questions. The, the health system right now is so time limited and time constrained that we're often seeing patients in very short windows in follow-up. So there will be questions that will come up after that you didn't get to answer. And that's why um, also in the healthcare system, there's this real push for having access to your chart, being able to email questions into your chart so that the team can answer. And by the way, that's better than having your doctor's cell phone number. I'll tell you why. For that same reason, if that doctor themselves gets injured or goes into the hospital or loses their phone or goes on vacation, they're not going to be able to answer but if you've yeah. sent a message into the chart there's a whole team of people it's the whole um yeah all of all of the cogs in the machine like all you want them. the whole you want the whole machine yeah that's right that's right you've oh, got that makes any number total of people sense. who can jump in and then answer you that way so 
That's right. Well, I think that's fabulous. And I hope that patients can take away from this um, just some tools that they can use and that they can share this with their doctors. Um, and hopefully more doctors, we can continue kind of having this, like you said, this conversation and this dialogue between patients and between caregivers, um, as well as all of the members of the team. So I think it's so important to, to talk about this. So thank you again for being here. Of course. My pleasure, Danae. I'd love to do it again.